Hello, friends, wherever you are. Nice to join you again in our consideration of reading the writings of Shoghi Effendi. What a heritage we have received from the beloved guardian. It's his shadow overshadows all mankind. And I don't believe there's any change in that state as his having passed away physically. He remains the shadow over the future until the coming of the next manifestation of God, when we'll have reinforcement, so to speak, for that period. Friends, last year, we, last uh, week, we looked at the question of uh, the first century. And what was the result of the first century and uh, reviewed some of that from a message of the Guardian in the 1940s leading up to the anniversary of the first centenary of the Baha'i faith in 1944. And then we are now moving on in our consideration of essential verities to consider various aspects of the of writings of the Bob, of the mission of the Bob, of the ministry of the Bob. And uh, we looked at titles of the Bob as uh, set forth in God Pass Us By. And this morning, uh, we're looking at uh, the first of um, several documents that I've got lined up here, uh, which is a, a resume by Shoghi Effendi in Promised Days Come of the progressive stages of the ministry of the Bob. Now, what we're doing here is trying to take advantage of the Guardian's synthesis, where he pulls together diverse events and places them in an order and characterizes them with a the position that they have. And it's, it's, this is a terrific uh, assistance to us to get our vision straight. And so one of the, the advantages we have in, in um, scanning over all of the works of the Guardian is to pull out these various passages. And now I want to start this morning with this, as I say, uh, from the early part of the message of the Guardian called The Promised Day Has Come. He uh, there outlines for, for your greater uh, understanding, he outlines the progressive stages in the ministry of the Bob. Then he does the same for Baha'u'llah. Then he does the same for the Master, these three central figures of the faith. Now here, we're considering the Bob, and you'll remember that the Bob is one of the twin manifestations of God of this holy dispensation. And uh, he is um, allied, do you remember the words of the guardian? Allied, though subordinate to Baha'u'llah. In other words, he revolves around Baha'u'llah, but he's an independent source of light. Like these star systems in the universe, some of them have twin stars for a uh, group of planets. And one is fixed usually, and then the second one revolves around. They both are independent sources of light, but they're in association with each other. And one of them is subordinate to the central one. And in this case, Paola is the supreme manifestation of God and He's allied with the Bob, and their two revelations are two revelatory light and inspiration illumined the entire Baha'i world and illumined its institutions, and that's, that's, that's the picture we get. So let us look at these, uh, at this. All right, let's see this come up now for you. Progressive stages of the ministry of the Bob. Yes. 
Um, cycling back to last, last week, we saw how the Bob has been characterized or is the point affirmed by Baha'u'llah round whom the realities of the prophets and messengers revolve. Uh, this, is, uh, this is essential, you know, uh, again, the, the Bab is considered by Baha'u'llah to be the monarch of God's messengers, the king of the messengers, as you recall from the Tabla of Ahmad. And he also indicates that he is the point around whom the realities of the prophets and messengers revolve. Now, one of the one of the things that's evoked in that is that those prophets and messengers revolve around the Bob symbolically by revolving around the shrine of the Bob. Now, in the spiritual world, this thing is happening at another at another level, at another reality, another level of comprehension. Um, Shoghi Effendi also, uh, when the question arose about if, er, if all these prophets and messengers are revolving around the Bob, then what's happening to Baji? And uh, he had responded that, that Bob and all those that circle around him in turn circle around Baji. In the spiritual realms, there's no problem to that. It may sound difficult to you on the physical level, but... Uh, Indeed, spiritually, that that's all happening simultaneously. So Shoghi Fendi is pointing out that he was the first to be swept into the maelstrom which engulfed his supporters. Uh, the Bob to, took the blow first. And these uh, bullet points are exactly as they're written in the message there of uh, edited here for emphasis in the, in the message of the Guardian sudden arrest and confinement in the very first year of his short and spectacular career. Then he goes on, he, this is, these are progressive stages here. Public affront deliberately afflicted, afflict, inflicted in the presence of the ecclesiastical dignitaries of Shiraz. Now, friends, you have to go back to your history books to the to the Godfathers by and to the Dawnbreakers to read the details of these. You'll want to know about this, his first arrest, his confinement, house arrest, so to speak. The front that he had, he suffered in front of the ecclesiastical dignitaries in Shiraz through the declarations he was called upon to make. The next was his strict and prolonged incarceration in the bleak fastnesses of the mountains of Azerbaijan. Uh, friends, I had the special bounty of making a pilgrimage to the cradle of the faith in 1973. And amongst um, places that uh, I was able to visit and observe, was the prison at Maku. And you know, it's tucked under a, a huge mountain, this dark, cold mountain that goes up, I don't know, 150 feet above the, above the, um, the prison quarter or the, the fortress quarter where the Bob was incarcerated. Bleak fastnesses, friends, the one I was there was kind of overcast there were birds of prey flying way up over the top of the mountain. There were constantly a rain of small pebbles and dust coming down off of the mountain onto the, the site of the fortress. And at, at that time, the, one of the four corners of the fortress uh, had been partially destroyed partially deteriorated, and that was the one that the Bob stayed in. And one was able to go into the very room that the Bob is defined as the 
highest paradise from when he was there. It's amazing uh, spirit that's there. And you could look down the mountain and see the places where some of the people, the local people of Maku would come every morning waiting for a sight, waiting to catch sight of the Bob and implore his blessings for their day, for their work day and for their devotions. Uh, it's a long history in Maku. Maku was not a Shia town, it was a Sunni town. And the prime minister thought that they would be more effective, it would be more effective to close the Bab into the Maku fortress because the Obviously, the Sunnis are hostile to the Shias, and they're not going to be interested in the Baba. Is the charm and the spirit that emanated from this person awoke the whole town and subsequent events that you can read about in the Dawnbreakers brought about a transformation in the in the keeper, the jailer, the person who was in charge of the Bob as his prisoner. Subsequently, now the authorities destroyed that whole corner of the of the uh, fortress itself, and they built a small mosque there to just erase the history of the Bob. But it's become known as the mosque where you your prayers and highest dreams and wishes will be responded to. And so people are making trips from other places to come there and pray in that little mosque. Meanwhile, the, the, the uh, authorities also in Iran, I understand, have decided to renovate the fortress itself as a historic monument, which will help us. I mean, they'll put it back together the way it was originally. Let's see how that, how that proceeds. But then I went on from there, I was able to go on to Cherik and walk in with some very dear friends, including the counselor Annalise Bach from the European Board of Counselors at that time and member of the teaching center subsequently some, some years after. We got all the way to the foot of the, the place where the fortress of Cherik was. And mostly every trace of the buildings was gone by that time, but it was a, a very interesting spot to visit and to be able to pray in special bounties. All right, moving on from this incarceration and here in the mountains of Azerbaijan, so this strict and prolonged incarceration refers both to the period in Maku and in Cherik. Then a contemptuous disregard and a cowardly jealousy evinced respectively by the chief magistrate of the realm, the Shah himself, and the foremost minister of his government, his prime minister. Disregard and jealousy. That that led to a carefully staged and farcical interrogatory sustained in the presence of the heir to the throne and the distinguished divines of Tabriz. Now the heir to the throne was the young Nasruddin, who became Nasruddin Shah with the passing of his father. And he was the eldest son of the favored wife of the of Muhammad Shah. The divines of Tabriz have included, of course, the, the, the fellow who used to lead the call to prayers and other distinguished authorities. They decided on, on the shameful infliction of the bastinado which was carried out in the prayer house and at the hands of the Sheikh al-Islam of the city. Shameful infliction, I can only imagine what he is paying for in the world to come. And finally, the suspension of the Bab in the barrack square of Tabriz 
and the discharge of a volley of above 700 bullets at his youthful breast under the eyes of a callous multitude of about 10,000 people. So visualize, you go back and study your history and visualize this succession of stages. It gives you a terrific overview. Finally, this all culminated in the ignominious exposure of his mangled remains on the edge of the moat without the city gate. So outside the city gate, beyond the market, the remains of the Bob and his young disciple that died with him were exposed. And it was from there, of course, that uh, it was possible to rescue those remains. These were the progressive stages in the tumultuous and tragic ministry of one whose age inaugurated the consummation of all ages and whose revelation fulfilled the promise of all revelations. These are the phrases that you know you want to take into your, your heart and contemplate this. The consummation of all ages. A revelation, uh, one whose revelation fulfilled the promise of all previous revelations. Everything in recorded religious history came to a, a point with the martyrdom of the Bob. Promise Days Come, page seven, that's paragraph 14. You can go back and see it in context, which you should do because I'm just uh, kind of pointing to these things, you know, and they need to be thought about more and more. See if I can bring up the next document here. There we go, centenary of the martyrdom of the Bob. Now, moving on from uh, the view of the century, the first century of the Bible, that is 1844 to 1944, we now have uh, another look, another take of the image of the, the sign of God on earth. At the time of the centenary, the first centenary of the martyrdom of the Bob in 1950, he addressed the American friends who were gathered uh, at the house of worship with it terrific message, a historic message, which again looks at the influence of the Bob on those hundred years since his martyrdom. So we're going to look at this a little bit. His message starts off his own words here. Move to share. This is in Kabylese, friends, so some of it sounds truncated, but it's not really. You just have to think through it's It's complete enough. Move to share with assembled representatives of American Baha'i community gathered beneath the dome of the most holy house of worship in the Baha'i world. Feelings of profound emotion evoked by this historic occasion of the worldwide commemoration of the first centenary of the martyrdom of the Blessed Bob, prophet and herald of the faith of Baha'u'llah founder of the dispensation, marking the culmination of the 6,000 year Adamic cycle. The culmination. An inaugurator of the 5,000th century Baha'i cycle. Oh, he really situates us right in the middle of all of this. Now friends, looking back here, it says the dome of the most holy house of worship in the Baha'i world. Ask yourselves, why was it the most holy house of worship in the Baha'i world? There was another one that had been built previously in Ishkabad. This became also the mother temple of the Baha'i world. 
although it was the second. Why is that? The answer I think you'll find to both of those in the presence, the physical and spiritual presence of Abdul Baha at the occasion of the groundbreaking on the property where this house of worship was built. And it's because of his influence that this house of worship is not only a holy place, a sacred holy place, but is a shrine of its own sort in the United States. Of course, the commemoration was worldwide. This message, by the way, was translated for the friends in the Cradle of the Faith for the National Assembly at the time. Now, how did the, how does the guardian standing at the head of the faith, looking out onto all horizons, how, how does he summarize what's, what's happened? He himself is so beautiful, it's so personal too, poignantly called to mind the circumstances attending the last act, consummating the tragic ministry of the master hero of the most sublime drama in the religious annals of mankind. Do we all get that? Last act, consummating the tragic ministry of the master hero of the most sublime drama in the religious annals of mankind, signalizing the most dramatic event of the most turbulent period of the heroic age of the Baha'i dispensation. Destined to be recognized by posterity as the most precious, momentous sacrifice in the world's spiritual history, bar none. So this becomes very significant from that point of view. In one of his own prayers, the Bob had written, great is the blessedness of those whose blood thou hast chosen wherewith to water the tree of thine affirmation and thus to exalt thy holy and immutable word. I can only imagine the supreme sacrifice, this most precious, momentous sacrifice in the world's spiritual history, destined to be recognized by posterity as, as the centuries move on here. Then he goes on, recall the peerless tributes paid to his memory by the founder of the faith, acclaiming him monarch of God's messengers. And again, the primal point around whom the realities of all the prophets circle in adoration. He says that he himself is profoundly stirred by the memories of the agonies the Bob suffered, the glad tidings he announced, the warnings he uttered the forces he set in motion, the adversaries he converted, the disciples he raised up, the conflagrations he precipitated, the legacy he left of faith and courage, the love he inspired. All these different facets of, of the, the Bob's ministry as highlighted here by the guardian of the faith. Uh, worth pausing in our meditations and our consideration of these passages and recalling what may this have referred to. If we don't know much about Baha'i history, it's going to be hard for us to know. But if we delve into Baha'i history and into the Dawnbreakers, we will understand about these agonies, something. The glad tidings he announced are in his, his writings. We have this volume of the writings of the Bob that we can look back into. 
warnings he uttered, forces he set in motion. These also reviewed. some of these have been reviewed in this very work, the promised day has come. The adversaries he converted. And eventually, what happened to them? What were the consequences of their adversity? The disciples he raised up, starting with the letters of the living and the other categories of believers who registered after them as the supporters and followers of the blessed Bob. The conflagrations he precipitated and by the very coming of his revelation and the, the spread of the letters of the living under his direction and their proclamation of the coming of the promised one, all of those led to the various outbreaks against perpetrated against the Bobby community by the government and the clergy. Then the legacy he left of faith and courage, and this also derives very much from reading the passages of the Dawnbergers. And the love he inspired, I mean, just the very episodes that we read in Baha'i history about him evoke in our hearts the tremendous love and longing and this has been greatly reinforced in the, in the hearts and minds of the Baha'is who have had the privilege of making pilgrimage to the Holy Land and visiting the international archives and there uh, witnessing the portraits of Baha'u'llah and the Bab, and particularly this uh, portrait of the Bob, which shows such majesty, but also meekness and humility. It's, it's an amazing image of the Bob. Now he's sur surveying, Shoghi, and he's going on to survey the effects of the Bob. Acknowledge with bowed head joyous, thankful heart, the successive marvelous evidence of his triumphant power in the course of the hundred years last since the last crowning act of his meteoric ministry. Friends, where could we ever come into contact with such things? Who, who was able to distinguish them? Here we have the guardian calling us to examine, review the marvelous evidences of this power during the course of a hundred years since the martyrdom of the bomb. Now he tells us more about that. He said, the creative energies released at the hour of the birth of his revelation, endowing mankind with the potentialities of the attainment of maturity are deranging during the present transitional age, this formative age, the equilibrium of the entire planet as the inevitable prelude to the consummation in world unity of the coming age of the human race. Our reaching statement of the guardian. Creative energies at the hour of the birth of his revelation, that would have been in Shiraz with Mullah Hussein and the other would be letters. And he's telling us these created energies have endowed mankind with the potentialities of the attainment of maturity. And Shagifani repeated this over and over in other places too. The dawn of the of the Baive through the declaration of the Bab released energies that ensured that mankind was going to attain maturity. Now, those energies with the potentialities of our attaining to maturity, the maturity being uh, centrally expressive in the unity of mankind, he said, these energies are deranging 
you know, understand the meaning of the word deranging, deranging the equilibrium. They are deranging during the present transitional age, this formative age. That's an alternative title for the formative age, age of transition, transitional age. The equilibrium of the entire planet. Uh, no place is going to escape the influence of these creative energies, and nor has it escaped. And this is happening now, the derangement of the world. And he says that this is the, he identifies this as the inevitable prelude. No way, to, no way around it, this derangement of the equilibrium of the planet. Inevitable prelude to the consummation in world unity of the coming of age of the human race. My goodness, friends, look where this is going. And inevitable prelude to the inevitable consummation in world unity of the coming of age of the human race. He moves on, he says, the portentous but unheeded warnings addressed to kings, princes, ecclesiastics are responsible. Now he's talked about how these energies go out and they are deranging. And now he's going to explain some aspects of it. One of them is the, what happened to the kings, princes, and ecclesiastics. So amongst his creative energies were these warnings. They are responsible for the successive overthrow of 14 monarchies of East and West. Friends, you can find a list of those in the Baha'i world in amongst the statistical and in the statistical reports that the Guardian prepared for the beginning of the World Crusade. And since then, a number of other have collapsed. And it's the collapse of the institution of the caliphate disappeared altogether. The virtual extinction of the Pope's temporal sovereignty. If you look a little bit into your history and into the history of the faith, you'll see that Pope Pius IX was the ruler of Northern Italy. I mean, he was, besides being the Pope, he was the king of all half of the country or something of it the important part of the country, center of the country. And that was removed, passed away after the warnings of the Bab and subsequently the tablet to the Pope of Baha'u'llah. Then he refers to the progressive decline in the fortunes of the ecclesiastical hierarchies of the Islamic, Christian, Jewish, Zoroastrian, and Hindu faiths. That's a big subject in itself. You need to look into that progressive decline in their fortunes. But uh, I think it's clear that uh, religion in general has taken a terrible hit in the, in the last 150 years. It was already deteriorated, and now it became even worse in its contentions and the lack of unity of the and vision of the leaders of these various world faiths. Then he goes on to say the old that the Bob eulogized and announced in his writings. And this is something we're going to get back into when we come to the dispensation later. Um, the Bob's pr proclamation in the Persian Bayan about the order of Baha'u'llah, whose laws Baha'u'llah, the Bab announced and eulogized this order, the future world order, and Baha'u'llah subsequently revealed its laws in the most holy book. And finally, its features were delineated by Abdul Baha in his will and testament. So interesting, we, we will see that this interaction between the forces released by Baha'u'llah that 
interacted with the mind of Abdul Baha in producing the various features of the institutions of the administrative order that were destined to come into being as a result of the revelation of Abdul Baha's will and testament. And then that, that, because of that, is this whole process is now passing through its embryonic stage through the emergence of the initial institutions of the world administrative order in the five continents of the globe. Now, uh, by 1950, uh, much had been done uh, to the development of the lowest uh, step, so to speak, in the image of this administrative order, the local spiritual assemblies, and that had led to the possibility of forming national spiritual assemblies, of which, as you'll recall, at the beginning of the World Crusade, there were 12. And they were destined to be greatly multiplied in the course of the Ten-Year Crusade. And then during the Crusade itself, during the years from 1951 on, the Guardian said the time had come now for the development of the world institutions of the faith, international institutions. We'd had the local development of local and the national assemblies, and now we called into being the International Baha'i Council and talked about it being the embryo, the forerunner, so to speak, of the Universal House of Justice, which would come into being at the end of the crusade under the direction of the hands of the cause of God. The clarion call sounded in the Kayoma last month summoning the peoples of the West to forsake their homes and proclaim his message, was nobly answered by the communities of the Western Hemisphere, headed by the valorous stalwart American believers, the chosen vanguard of the all-conquering, irresistibly marching army of the faith in the Western world. So this is quite so amazing that in this first book, and indeed in this very first chapter that was revealed in the presence of Mullah Hossein, the Bab called upon the people of the West, West to issue forth from their homes and proclaim his message to mankind. This was subsequently answered, nobly answered, he says, by the communities of the Western Hemisphere headed by the valorous stalwart American believers, who he characterizes as the chosen vanguard of the all-conquering, irresistibly marching army of the faith in the Western world. Now, friends, uh, why, were, why were the Americans so important in this? Uh, the, if you've been reading the advent of divine justice and many friends I know have gone back to read that and the house of justice is recommended that's one of the things that we should uh, carefully study and we see that it was not because they were so great but because they were representative of the most materialistic uh, center uh, of, of materialism in in the world and very wedded to their material well-being and their material things. And to show the power of the from Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha, there were progressive calls on the American people and the American believers in particular to arise and carry out the divine plan, which Abdu Baha had established with the revealing of 14 tablets called the tablets of the divine plan and then that that was divided into progressive stages by shogi effendi and assigned to the to the believers first of the north american believers starting in 1937 with the first seven year plan which led up to the centenary the first centenary of the faith itself and then subsequent uh, undertakings. 
both by the American buys in connection with their chief ally, the Canadian buys, and then joined by believers all over the world whom the Guardian called auxiliaries in the accomplishment of the divine plan. Finally, he says, the embryonic faith maturing three years after his martyrdom, traversing the period of infancy in the course of the heroic age of the faith is now steadily progressing towards maturity in the present formative age, destined to attain full stature in the golden age by dispensation. So we see the Bob was martyred in 1853 and 52, 53 period. His faith gained maturity through the calling of Baha'u'llah to his prophethood, to his, to his station as a manifestation of God while he was in the Seer Chal, imprisoned in the Seer Chal. It's then the faith, as we're referring back to the faith, which is, of course, the joint faith of the Bab and Baha'u'llahs, traversed the period of infancy in the course of the heroic age of the faith, and is now steadily progressing towards maturity in the present formative age. And that's destined to lead to a full stature, the appearance of the faith in its full stature in the golden age of the Baha'i dispensation. And finally, lastly, the holy seed of infinite preciousness, that is the Bob's reality itself, holding within itself incalculable potentialities, representing the culmination of the centuries old process of the evolution of humanity through the energies released by the series of progressive revelations starting with Adam and concluded by the revelation of the seal of the prophets, marked by the successive appearance of the branches, leaves, buds, blossoms, and plucked after six brief years by the hand of destiny, 1850, ground in the mill of martyrdom and oppression, but this seed, having been ground in this way through martyrdom and oppression, yielded the oil whose first flickering light cast upon the somber subterranean walls of the seed child of Tehran, out of the heart of Baha'u'llah, whose fire gathered brilliance in Baghdad and shone in the full resplendency in its crystal globe in Adrianople, we see the growing rise of the Son of Truth in Baha'u'llah's ministry, whose rays warmed and illumined the fringes of the American, European, Australian continents through the tender ministerings of the center of the covenant. So Abdul Baha, through his influence, propagated these rays through his chosen disciples, through those that arose to visit all these different places and those continents. And whose radiance, he now tells us, is overspreading the surface of the globe during the present formative age. These were things that took these, reached these continents during the, still during the heroic age, during Abdu'l-Bah's ministry. Then under the guardian, the radiance was spread out over the whole surface of the globe in the formative age. And now that radiance, that same light that had been infused by God into the world through these twin manifestations and whose light had been spread, diffused over the whole face of the planet now 
were to witness the full splendor it's destined in the course of the future of future millenniums to suffuse the entire planet. So again, we have this infusion, diffusion, and suffusion of the divine light in these various stages of the development of the work of the cause. This has all been extracted from a message of Shoghi Effendi that you find in the book Citadel of Faith, page 80, July 4th, 1950. Friends, now we need to, to go to what turns out to be an elaboration by Shoghi Effendi of the station of the Bob and a clarification and illumination with respect to what that station is. Uh, the Baha'is in the time of the master, they knew about the Bab, but mostly they thought of him in terms of the way they understood John the Baptist served the interests of Jesus Christ, which has a parallel, but it's not entirely clear from the Gospels what that parallel was. In the uh, Quran, John the Baptist is affirmed to be a prophet of God, a messenger of God with his own laws, one of his laws being that of baptism, which Christ himself submitted to. Uh, so earlier we saw that the Bab was the herald hmm, of the faith and prophet, herald and prophet of the faith of Baha'u'llah. This is not herald, sometimes he's called the martyr prophet, but we under, want to understand that these are two different functions. And as we will see, as we move through this material, which is from the dispensation of Baha'u'llah now, from the world order of Baha'u'llah letters, we will see how important that the Bob's function as a prophet was more important than his role as a herald. So if you have your books, you can find it there. They've got it broken down on the screen just to point out a few of the singular aspects of terrific interest. The Guardian had, in two previous World Order letters, he'd raised the question of the station of the Bob and how important the Bob was. And it will come to a prophecy which he repeated twice in those letters. Where he, in Islam, he said that uh, knowledge, all knowledge was divided into 27 letters. And up to the appearance of the Bab, or the contribution of all the previous manifestations of God, were two of those, of the equivalent of the 27 letters. And that the Bab himself, and the age in which he's delivered his message, the but along with Baha'u'llah, you remember that Baha'u'llah calls him my own previous manifestation. The Bab and Baha'u'llah are identified, of course, in spiritual reality. They're singular. But we see now that the um, the Guardian is stressing the Bob, inaugurator of the Bobby dispensation, which is a dispensation that runs parallel with the Baha'i era. The Baha'i era takes in the but he is fully entitled to rank as one of the self-sufficient manifestations of God. Now we go back, hark back to the Kitabi Gan where Baha'u'llah says that there are two kinds of manifestations, and the manifestations endowed with constancy are the manifestations that have been called upon to deliver the law of God. And there are other manifestations that appear on their shadow, prophets that appear in the shadow of those messengers, who 
propagate and promulgate, uh, elaborate on the laws that the prophets endowed with constancy have brought. And the Bab is one of those self-sufficient manifestations of God. that he has been invested with sovereign power and authority and exercises all the rights and prerogatives of independent prophethood is yet another fundamental verity which the message of Baha'u'llah insistently proclaims and which its followers must uncompromisingly uphold. So far from uh, reducing the role of the Bab who comes in as a culmination to the whole Adamic cycle of manifestations of God. He, he, his sovereign power and authority is clear and he has his own independent prophethood. And we shouldn't just reduce it again as to a herald, being a herald that he is not to be regarded merely as an inspired precursor of the Baha'i revelation, that in his person, as he himself bears witness in the Persian Payan, the object of all the prophets gone before him has been fulfilled. And he states that this is a truth which I feel it my duty to demonstrate and emphasize. As I say in several previous World Order letters, Shoghi Fendi has already shown the comparative greatness, the magnitude of the content of the revelation of the Bab as compared to the whole line of prophets in the Adamic cycle that have produced two of the 27 letters. And he produced the likeness of the other 25. Nothing. It's, it's so amazing the difference in the other in another quote that we saw back there the disciples that the Bob for example are I think he said 10,000 times greater than the disciples uh, in Muhammad's day and that's that's because of the greatness of the message which the Bob has brought and the truths that he's revealed Otherwise, in their inner divine nature, they're one. In the abstract divine nature, the prophets of God are all one, and their voice is a single voice. But Shoghi Fendi is sorting out the differences uh, in the ministry of these great figures. Again, he goes on to say, we would assuredly be failing in our duty to the faith we profess and would be violating one of its basic and sacred principles if in our words and by our conduct we hesitate to recognize the implications of this root principle of Baha'i belief or refuse to uphold unreservedly its integrity and demonstrate its truth. Indeed, the Guardian goes on the chief motive actuating me to undertake the task of editing and translating Nabil's immortal narrative, that would be the Dawnbreakers, has been to enable every follower of the faith in the West to better understand and more fully grasp the tremendous implications of his exalted station and to me to more ardently admire and love him. So he is allied though with Baha'u'llah and he reigns over the destinies of our faith. In other words, he has retained his prophetic relationship to us in the present dispensation. And this is affirmed in the writings of our cause and we'll come to those, the passage specifically where Abdu'l Baha affirms this. Friends, this, this the Guardian had early on before so much else. He bothered to take a year and translate Nabil's immortal narrative, the Dawnbreakers, so that we could 
partake of the episodes of the history of the Bob. He edited and translated the volume himself and uh, has urged that it become the main text of history on the faith in our summer schools and in for our Baha'i knowledge in general. I hope if you don't have a copy of the narrative that you make some effort to acquire it and read it and study it and master the details that's in it as the guardian has urged us to do. Continuing on from the dispensation, there can be no doubt that the claim to the twofold station ordained by the Bob, ordained for the Bob by the Almighty, a claim which he himself has so boldly advanced, which Baha'u'llah has repeatedly affirmed, and to which the will and testament of Abdul Baha has finally given the sanction of its testimony. This claim constitutes the most distinctive feature of the Baha'i dispensation, something that characterizes it from all the other dispensations, and that is that at the center of our cause we have twin manifestations operating simultaneously in their blessing and influence on the development and growth of the believers and of the cause. It is a further, the guardian goes on, it is a further evidence of its uniqueness, a tremendous accession to its the strength, to the mysterious power and authority with which this holy cycle has been invested. This day is not an ordinary day. This is the day of God par excellence. And though you don't uh, always stress this, we should, uh, in our teaching work, we should be acquiring as clear, as fresh a vision of it in our own relationship to these twin prophets who are at the center of our prayers so that we can partake and rejoice in this very distinctive feature that he mentions here. And not that it should, that it should escape us in any way. So indeed, the greatness of the Bob consists primarily not in its being the divinely appointed forerunner of so transcendent a revelation, but rather in his having been invested with the powers inherent in the inaugurator of a separate religious dispensation and in his wielding to a degree unrivaled by messengers, by the messengers gone before, the scepter of independent prophethood. What are the implications of Baha'u'llah saying that the Bab is the monarch of God's messengers? What are the implications of the role he will play in the concourse on high. Shoghi Effendi at one point, he draws a, a visual image in his, one of his messages to the East where he talks about Baha'u'llah seated on the throne of glory and the Bab seated on his right and Abdul Baha seated at his feet. And then the, he names the subsequent ranks of messengers of God and the prophets and their holy ones and the martyrs and so on that are formed the concourse around them. Amaz amazing message. See if I can pick up a translation of that for use here later on. Okay, now you might, somebody might come up with an objection. Um, The short duration of his dispensation, imagine, for the purposes of the definition of that dispensation, uh, today we can say it was nine, nine years until 
Paola received his message in the said child. The restricted range within which his laws and ordinance have been made to operate, uh, they never really were promulgated in a way that became common knowledge. And what he did reveal, he said, was dependent on he whom God will make manifest. This is provided for him so that he doesn't have to take time away from warbling on the branches of the tree of eternity. Verily, verily, I am God and there is no God but me. A astounding statement. In any case, these supply, supply no criterion whatever wherewith to judge its divine origin, the Bobby dispensation, and to evaluate the potency of its message. Now Shoghi Effendi begins gathering evidence from the holy writings to support his claims and his explanation of this. That so brief a span, Baha'u'llah himself explains, should have separated this most mighty and wondrous revelation from my own previous manifestation is a secret that no man can unravel and a mystery such as no mind can fathom. Its duration had been foreordained and no man shall ever discover its reason unless and until he be informed of the contents of my hidden book. Well, good luck on that one. Friends, let me see what time is it? Oh, it's already past our hour here. So we're now beginning to enter into these various passages, which of which there are going to be many in this section on the on the Bob, reinforcing and buttressing the vision that Shoghi Effendi has provided us of this, the dual function of the Bob and of indeed the higher function of his being a manifestation of God. Let's go briefly to the chats now, friends, and see what we've got over here. All right. This has been an interesting week huh, with the, the passing of our loved ones, former colleagues. You've been informed of all of those from the messages from the World Center. Question. Safe and protected from the fire so far. We've had to... Uh, take up smoking in a couple cases, but other than that, we've been all right. Well, there's some questions here about the duress of martyrdom and instant death. Uh, friends, when the persecution after the Iranian Revolution, when the persecution turned on the Baha'is again and was causing uh, multiple deaths, I mean, we're talking about several hundred key Baha'is were eliminated. Most of them just disappeared. You don't know what's happened to them. Later on, we hear about how they were sequestered and shot and martyred right very shortly after they were taken. But all of that sent, um, sent breezes of clarity into the lives of Western Baha'is that I belong, I'm alive and I belong to a religion who, whose followers in one of the countries of the world are being picked out and eliminated 
being killed with no due process of law or such such and such. And inevitably, all of us from the West had to ask ourselves, am I ready for, would I stand up against this kind of treatment if I were asked to affirm the faith and deny, not never deny its reality, never deny its truth? It was a very sobering time. And with all these messages we send out about who was being killed, how many were killed, how many martyrs, how many imprisoned, and so on, the House of Justice uh, occasionally received a message back from some of the friends that said, this is so depressing. Can't you send us some, you have to keep sending these very dark messages, you know, can't you send us something uplifting? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> meanwhile, we were, you know, in a, a bath of tears in the Holy Land getting these messages because you didn't know in the morning when you got to your desk what new calamity was was there very difficult on those of us that knew the friends who were being sequestered and martyred. Mr. Dunbar, say something it says at the end. <laughs> Well, I think I've had my say here today. You're all very kind and patient. And again, let me emphasize that this is my own personal take. Uh, and I hope reflective of the devotion and enthusiasm I have for the cause and uh, sharing with some of the thoughts. I can also occasionally give some cross-referencing that helps to clarify things like most holy house of worship for for instance today uh we'll look forward to going on with the further elaboration of the guardian's explanation and elucidation of this station of the bob next week on some more huh I think I'm gone. Am I still here? No, I haven't left yet. I see there's another question here of uh, it really should have come up, but it didn't come up yet. Oh, sorry, we missed that at the beginning. There's a question about did Baha'u'llah address any messages to the leaders of China, India, or the Far East? Uh, yes, all of them, because he in several letters, he addresses collectively the whole body of all the kings and rulers. O ye kings of the earth. This is these, this, it covered everybody. There were then individual apostrophes, individual messages to a number of them, but uh, not to all of them. And there were no individual ones as I understand to the Far East, to China, India, and the Far East. Okay, friends, I'm going to leave you now, and, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>